Hi. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace of God be upon each and every one of you. Welcome to Gems for the Traveler. My name is Imam Muhammad Abdul Aziz. I work at the Salam Center in Sacramento, California. In this series, we explore the different facets and the different names and attributes of God Almighty. This is the month of Ramadan, and Muslims come to the mosque in order to learn, in order to grow spiritually, and connect with their Creator. In this series, we attempt at learning more about God through studying His names. I invite each and every one of you to join us on this beautiful journey to learn more about the qualities and the attributes of the Creator of heavens and earth. Thank you so much for tuning in. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Tonight uh, we actually uh, remember uh, an incredible event uh, that took place uh, in Islamic history, a transformative event, an event that changed uh, everything uh, that happened in Ramadan uh, some 14. Uh, 120 years ago. The scholars say uh, from Riyayatul uh, Aghnami, from Riyayatul Umam, ila Qiyadatul Umam, from herding sheep to the leadership of nations. And uh, we see what happened after the conquest of Mecca and the establishment of the state. We see uh, uh, the establishment of government on, on rules of justice. We see uh, 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 science and technology, the translation of all Greek works. Western civilization owes its very democratic ideals to the Abbasis who worked so hard on translating the works of Aristotle and, and, and other Greek philosophers and you know Plato's Republic that they keep raving about that every student of political science or philosophy or law or, or sociology or whatever it may be in the social sciences or humanities needs to study it was translated first to Arabic and that is, that is why it was preserved. The Renaissance started in Baghdad, right? Before, when, when Europeans were crawling on their knees in caves, like, like the primitive cavemen, uh, uh, the streets of Baghdad and, and Qutba in, in, in Andalusia were lit by public posts that are monitored and maintained by the government. So I see that warring Arab tribes who fought with each other for water and resources all of a sudden became an the inspiration for humanity. How did that transformation take place? And, and the pivotal point of that transformation was actually the conquest of Mecca, right? The city of Mecca that was the center of paganism and the center of worshiping idols became the light that, was, that started emanating to the entire world, right? How did it happen? And that transformation, changing the Arabs from one state to the other, Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving them that strength, that guidance, that support, right? preserving them, is what tonight's name is about. Right? Allah's name, Al-Wali. Al-Wali linguistically means a deputy, a representative, a wakil. When a woman gets married, it is required in an Islamic contract for her to have a wali. And the wali is basically, as, as the Arabs linguistically used to say, قريب أو حبيب حريص على مصلحة مدافع مناصب someone who's close to you someone who is a relative possibly someone who cares about your interests someone who looks out for you someone who provides you advice help support who acts on your behalf right who does things for you without you even asking for them or requesting them this is the meaning the linguistic meaning of wali al walai now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-wali, as I said earlier, he is the one that protects, he is the one that preserves, he is the one that bestows honor, that gives victory, that hands over triumph, that takes care of, of your affairs without you having to worry about those affairs. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as they say colloquially, he's got your back. This is what it boils down to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got your back. That's what it means. Al-wali. But it's interesting because I said earlier that we call human beings wali as well, right? So we are Allah's awliya. You and every one of you could be wali of Allah 
meaning a wakil, a deputy, a representative of Allah's interests. You're doing things on Allah's behalf. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your wali. There is no other name of Allah that carries that double meaning, brothers and sisters. I could be a kareem in the sense that I have honor, but I cannot be a kareem with regard to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I cannot bestow any honor or, or, or I cannot be generous with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, can you? Right? Um, I can be aziz, someone who is uh, of, of status or honor, right? But can you be aziz with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ever. But every one of us can be wali with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the only name where that can be achieved. When the quality is mutual, he can be your wali and you are his wali as well. Let me share with you initially, I usually preserve the stories to the end. But there is a story, the usage of which will actually serve a purpose right away. And that is the story of Yusuf a.s. Yusuf was Allah's wali and Allah was his wali. He was Allah's deputy and Allah was his deputy. He took care of Allah's affairs in his capacity as a leader, as we will see. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again took care of all of his affairs. <laughs> and it started with the moment when he was thrown in the empty well. The caravan ran out of water and that's why they swung by the well in order to see if there is water or not. Have you ever thought of the possibility that those people would have, not, would have had enough water and they would have never needed to actually come to the well? Right? Al Wali subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them again, he's working on behalf of Yusuf alayhi salam and he's stuck in, in the well, he can't go anywhere, he can't do anything for himself. But his Wali subhanahu wa ta'ala was working to his benefit on his behalf without him having to do anything. And then he put the love of Yusuf in the heart of Aziz al Masr, the Lord of Egypt, possibly uh, synonymous to present day ministry of Minister of Finance. And his wife. And that man did not have any children, right? And he was infertile and, and he was not able to have marital relations with his wife. You know, possibly that's why she was so frustrated and, and started hitting on poor Yusuf, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the love of Yusuf in his heart and that of his wife. Why? Because he wanted to create a favorable, friendly environment for a prophet that was literally kidnapped from his own family, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the king to have a dream. And all of the aides and the advisors of the king, they failed to actually interpret the dream. I mean, think about it. One of them could have just gone up to the king and said, you know what, yes, I have the interpretation of your dream. And this makes something up. Rather, they were honest with the king and they said, مَا نَحْنُ بِتَأْوِيلِ الْأَحْلَامِ Right? We, we have no idea. We don't know about this whole uh, interpreting the... Uh, the dreams, business, is, that's not my hard thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the, the king to declare his desire to have someone who can interpret the dreams and that's how Yusuf alayhi salam was released from prison. All of that in order to achieve what? In order to position Yusuf alayhi salam, see, Al-Wali is at work for you. And he positions Yusuf alayhi salam to eventually become the minister of finance of Egypt himself. In order for him to start becoming the wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To take care of the affairs of his people. To make da'wah to the people of Egypt. And I, I say he's in a position of leadership. I say to everyone and anyone in a position of leadership, you are in essence a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're his deputy. You take care of his affairs. And taking care of the affairs of his people is part and parcel of taking care of his affairs of subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, I am shattering the myths we had in our minds about what wali or awliya actually meant, right? And I wanted us to focus on the very last conclusion of the journey of Yusuf alayhi salam. At the very end of Surah Yusuf, he speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says to Allah, رَبِّ قَدْ أَتَيْتَنِي مِنَ الْمُلْكِ وَعَلَّمْتَنِي مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ فَاطِرَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَنْتَ وَلِيِّ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْأَرْضِ That is the conclusion of the journey of, of Yusuf alayhi salam acknowledging the role that Allah played in his life. Without him having to imagine the kind of issues and challenges and, 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 and attacks and, and, and worries and plotting that is against you. 
every single day. You cannot be aware of all of that. You cannot protect yourself from, think of, of bacteria and viruses and illnesses and plagues. Think of, of God forbid, you know, different forms of cancer that happen to people. Think of people who are jealous of you. Think of accidents that could happen. Loss of wealth and loss of life. All kinds of million, a million things could happen, but Al-Wali subhanahu wa ta'ala protects you from that. And I am leading this khatira to one notion, and that is how to become awliya of Allah. That's what I want. Because I want that blessing. I want that barakah. I want the protection. I want the hifz, the preservation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the hadith that all of us are very, very familiar with. And this hadith basically uh, talks about awliya of Allah Azza wa مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيٌ فَقَدِ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whoever shows enmity to any of my deputies, to any of my awliya, I declare war on him. Ya Allah. That's what I want. I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to declare war on my enemies so I don't have to deal with them myself. You know, as, as the Sahaba used to say in their dua, Allahumma ahlika al-dhalimina bil-dhalimin wa akhrizna min baynihim salimin. Cause the aggressors to uh, ruin and destroy each other and extract from their midst unscathed. Wouldn't that be the best? Someone else fights your battle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to fight your battle. Someone shows enmity to any of his awliya, he declares war. And then he says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَبْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ you cannot offer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything that is more pleasing to him than that which he has made mandatory upon you. In other words, you cannot say, well, I spent my entire night doing qiyam and tasbih and reading the Quran and tahajjud. I got so tired, I missed fajr. Would that work? It's, it was in vain. Why? Because salat al-subh at fajr time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a million times more important than anything else you could offer. Right? I fast Mondays and, and, and Thursdays, alhamdulillah, on a regular basis. But Ramadan, you know, I fall short a little bit. Can you make that argument? If you fast your entire lifetime, it will not make up for one day of fasting in Ramadan. Why? Because fasting in Ramadan is fard. And you offer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fard is more important, beloved to Him, than anything else you could offer. Uh, SubhanAllah, I am wearing a beard and I'm such a good Muslim and I say Jazakallah khairan. But you know, when it, comes to, uh, 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 when it comes to controlling my anger, you know, I'm not really good at that. Will that argument work? No, you can grow all the beards you want, but if you're falling short on an obligation in Islam, such as controlling your temper and not unloading it on, on, on innocent people, you're gone, right? I am such a good Muslim, and, and I say SubhanAllah 75 times every day. But I backbite a little bit, that's a weakness I have. Will that work? Absolutely not. The definition of what is religious and what is not religious has changed in our lives. We consider, if we say, say certain words, and dress a certain way, and wear a kufi, or wear a hijab, or wear a beard, or, or say Jazakallah khairan, or come to the masjid and pray, that is religious. The way we treat each other and the way we treat other people has nothing to do with religion anymore. Why do you have to insert religion in the way I sell stuff at my business? Because that's the crux of the matter. There is nothing you can do that is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than following his fara'id. And then he says, and when people start offering nawafid, exceeding expectations, now they're doing the sunnah, they're doing things that are not necessarily expected of them, they give their sadaqah, but at the same time, they give their zakah first, which is more important. But then, they gradually start giving extra sadaqah. Can you say, well, I donated at the banquet $5,000, but I didn't give my zakah? You cannot say that. It's in vain. It's a waste. Right? So establish the fara'id, and then you go into the sunnah, you know, the, the extra things. You take some uh, uh, baklawa and, and, and give it to your neighbors on the day of Eid. Is that fard? What is fard? Is that, you know, as the Prophet says, يَأْمَنُ جَارُهُ بَوَائِقَ That your neighbors are safe from your aggressions and inequities. That is what's fard. That I don't play the music so high that it bothers my neighbors. Right? 
that I don't do things that will that will make it hard for my neighbors to accept me accept me as their neighbor. But giving them baklava, that is part of the nawafil. You understand it? Establish the faraid and then go into the nawafil. Right? Pray your dhuhr and then pray the extra rak'ah as sunnah. This is how it works. Perfect your fasting in Ramadan and then fast in you know, the 13, 14, and 15 of every Hijri month. Right? Be honest and sincere, compassionate, loving, understanding, non judgmental, fara'id. And then we talk about other things. And the more you do of those other things, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. And once He loves you, He says, Kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bih. Allah becomes your hearing. He becomes your ears with which you hear things. He becomes your eyes with which you see stuff. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes your hands and He becomes your legs. What does that mean? How many of you heard this hadith before? How many heard this? Seriously, how many of you heard the hadith before? Seriously, I, I thought that it, I thought that most of you would, would have heard this hadith because they mention it all the time and most people don't understand it. What does it mean for Allah to be my eyes and Allah to be my ears? I tell you what it means. Al Wali subhanahu wa ta'ala only causes you to hear things that are good and beneficial for you and preserves you from hearing things that are not appropriate. For example, you come to the khutbah and you're all sleepy and you had a bad night and you didn't sleep well and you're so busy with work. So you're not paying attention to what the khatib is saying. But al-wali subhanahu wa ta'ala the khatib is about to say hadith or an ayah or something that will directly impact your life. Something happened and then you snap out of it and you actually hear what the khatib is saying. Is this something you can control? You cannot control that. This is a mere blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're watching television and it's basically the, 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 the baseball game, whatever. And then, you know, there's a commercial. And right when there's an inappropriate commercial, you get a phone call and you leave the room. And then you come back and you find, oh man, alhamdulillah that you got out of the room. It was a really bad commercial that was shown right now. You can't control that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes you to see what you need to see. And He blinds you from things that you, that you, don't, that you don't have to see. How can Allah be your feet? Imagine that you wanted to go to a, a concert or to a, a movie or whatever it is with only your friends and then you're trying to buy tickets and there are no more tickets left. Tickets left. And then afterwards you say, Alhamdulillah that I didn't go and it was really not appropriate for me to be there. I'm glad that they ran out of tickets. This is how Allah works in your life. So you become invincible. You become like Superman. Right? You start making changes in your life and in the lives of people around you. Let me share with you some examples again to solidify, inshallah, this meaning. And I spoke with you about Ibrahim salam before. And Ibrahim, from one extreme of, of being in the midst of a fire, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to give instructions to the fire not to burn Ibrahim. To the other extreme of Allah telling Ibrahim, Inni ja'iluka linnasi imama. SubhanAllah, he was fearful for his life, about to get charred in the fire, and then, Ya yeah, Ibrahim, I will make you a guidance to people, a leader, someone to be followed. What happens today? The three organized, major organized religions of the world, they call themselves the, the Abrahamic religions. Why? Because they all trace their heritage to Ibrahim who passed thousands and thousands of years ago. Al-Wali subhanahu wa ta'ala does that. Even after your death, you're still making a difference. Right? One of the Sahaba, the Prophet his name was Al-Ala ibn Hadrami. And he was a really good negotiator, and he was a great diplomat. So the Prophet sent him as a messenger to the king of Bahrain. Right? So he goes there with a group of his uh, aides, and then he gets lost in the desert. And then they come to him after they have run out of water and food, and they come to Ala in order to ask him, Ya Ala, what do we do now? We're going to die. So Ala does something very, very strange. He raises his hands and he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbil Alameen, aqsamtu alayka al 
How many of you, like, of Arab heritage, you can understand what I just said right now? How easy is that to translate to English? It's very difficult to translate this particular, and you know, I translate almost everything. But this one, I thought long and hard about how to translate it. Ya Allah, aqsamtu alayka an tasqina. It is a way of imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's all, it also means that you're taking an oath and you're expecting Allah to fulfill your oath. So you can say, I swear, or wallahi, I will do this. Or you can say, wallahi, ya Allah, you will do this. Is that even appropriate? I mean, it, it, it doesn't sound appropriate, but people who are awliya of Allah azza wa jal, they reach that level of iman and devotion, and they have that expectation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Didn't I tell you you become invincible? You become like, like super, you become a superhero. Without necessarily having to throw spider webs on the walls and, and use them and catch, catch them to fly or anything like that. You, you will make a difference in your life and that of others by being a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then his aides basically say, Wallahi, it was only minutes before the clouds started forming and it started raining and we didn't, we didn't have enough containers to take water. We had to fill our stomachs and take whatever containers we have and we filled them with water. It's, it's, just, it's as simple as that. And that is called karama. It's not a miracle. And I'll tell you what, what the difference between those two are in a second because I don't want you to get carried away and to think, oh my God, that's a miracle. It happened to the Sahaba. It's not a miracle. I'll tell you what it means. Another Sahabi, his name was Ibra ibn Malik. Al-Bara'a ibn Malik was actually known to be extremely brave. He was like borderline foolhardy. Like totally reckless sometimes. That the Sahaba, Khulafa, especially Abu Bakr and Muhammad, they would never let him lead an army because they know that he will just march with his, with his, uh, with his men straight to slaughter. Right? He was that brave. He, he wouldn't care. When it was the Battle of Yemen, who were we fighting in Yemen? The followers of... Musaylama, right? Musaylama al-Kadhaf, in the eastern part of, of Arabia. So there were so many Sahaba on that day. They actually say that 70, 70 of the companions of the Prophet, of the Huffal, they used to memorize the Qur'an. They were all killed on that day. It is one of the reasons actually prompted Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to collect all the Qur'an into one, into one book. So they basically went around and spoke with Khalid ibn al-Walid and others, you know, what are we going to do? So Al-Bara ibn Malik basically said something similar. He said to him, Ya Ahl al madinati wallahi la madina lakum. O people of Medina, there's no Medina for you. Are you worried about death because you want to go back to Medina? Well, guess what? If you lose this battle, those barbarian hordes, they will come to your own city and sack it and destroy it and kill men, women, and children. La madina lakum, balillahu wal jannah. The only thing that is left for you is Allah and Jannah. You live, you live for them, you die, you die for them today. Right here, right now. His words brought the Muslims together and gave them some strength of heart. And that's how the, the, the followers of Musaylama were pushed back into the fortress. It was extremely powerfully fortified. And the Muslims put it under siege for weeks. And they couldn't reach it. And eventually, Al-Bara ibn Malik told Khalid and others, well, there's only one solution. Someone needs to get inside and open the gate from inside. Kind of like, you know, a Trojan horse. But there was nothing Trojan about it. Because what Al-Bara suggested to them is that you need to throw somebody over the fortress to fall on the other side and open the door. So they said, okay, first of all, we don't have any crazy companion who will agree to a suicide mission like this. Second, how on earth are we going to throw someone over the wall? Number three, what, how would he even survive the fall? Number four, he'll be surrounded by a thousand soldiers who will probably get to him before he gets to the gate. That's an insane idea. He said, you know what? First of all, I volunteer. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about any crazy suicidal uh, member of our, of our army. Second of all, we have a catapult. You put me on the catapult, and you release it, and then it throws me over the fortress, I fall inside, 
and then I'll, I'll open the gate. I said, Bara, you totally lost your mind, right? <laughs> and he said, no, no. Allah waliyyi, Allah yahni. My wali, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will protect me. See, you cannot reach a level, I promise you. You cannot reach a level where you have that kind of confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he turns you down. The problem is, you never reach that level. You always approach it with, you know, I'm not sure if my iman is that strong, but I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> right? But if you approach it the way Al-Bara ibn Malik approached it, or the way Ala al-Hadrami approached it, Ya Allah, you do this for me right now. Because in your, in your Quran you said that you accept the dua, and we are in a position of need. You do your part, I do my part. End of story. Because if Allah does not respond, that will basically shake your iman completely. But if your iman is weak, and Allah doesn't respond, you will always say to yourself, well, well, my iman is weak, that's probably why Allah did not answer my prayer. But if your iman is solid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will technically have no choice but to give you what you ask for. So they catapult Al-Bara ibn Malik into the fortress, and he falls on the roof, he breaks an arm, and from the roof he falls like three stories down, and like... 25 soldiers, of course, they took everyone by surprise. He fights them with his other arm, with a small dagger he had, and, and he was able to kill a couple and hurt the rest, and he actually ran to the gate, opened it up, and the Muslims were able to enter. And that's how he manifested. That's how it felt. And he didn't die that day. He didn't die. He survived. He actually died later on as a shaheed in, in, in one of the battles in, in Persia. But that is Al-Walaya, brothers and sisters. And some of you might say, well, that's a miracle, right? Is that a miracle? It's not a miracle. A man flying over a fortress and falling and not dying, is that possible or not? It's possible. It's very unlikely, but it's possible. If you fall on a big, huge mattress, you're not going to die. Right? If you fall with the right angle, on the right spot, and, 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 and kind of roll over a certain way, you're not going to die. You might not even break anything. And that's the definition of karam. As opposed to carving out a, a camel from the mountain. Is that a miracle or a karam? That's a miracle, because it literally defies the, the rules of science. No science can explain it whatsoever. But the karama could happen. The karama is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aligning certain circumstances to your benefit and to your favor to help you get certain things done that were your limited human knowledge and abilities you're not able to. This is al-walaya, brothers and sisters. And it is a state of iman that is so hard to attain. You might live your entire lifetime trying to get there. And you may or may not be able to. But once you get there, you will do things in your life that you never thought possible. But it only takes three things. As I said earlier, establish the fara'id of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then establish the nawafil and all the sunan and be in the service of others. Kun waliyan linnas, as the sahaba used to say. Be yourself wali to other people. Take care of their affairs. Help them out. Never let them down when they ask you for help. If a brother is moving from one apartment to the other, uh, some help to be done at the masjid, uh, someone who is sick at the hospital and needs to be visited, uh, a family dispute that needs someone to mediate, always, always, always be in the service of others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be in your service. كان الله في عون العبد ما كان العبد في عون أخي. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds and to forgive our sins and to be our wali, to be our preserver, to be our protector, to be the source of our guidance, and the one who hands us victory. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who persevere down this, his path in the life of this world, and those who are admitted to the Jannah on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Gems for the Traveler. Uh, if you have any questions about the material you just watched, or if you would like to come to Salam in order to join us for one of the services, please visit our website at www.salamcenter.org, or you can visit my Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash Imam Aziz. I hope that this episode touched your hearts spiritually as it did ours. God bless you all. Thank you.